Restaurant Evit is a hot spot for gourmets who want to see a bold and creative approach to the use of Korean ingredients. At the restaurant, chef Joseph Lidgerwood is in the spotlight for his dishes that reinterpret Korean cuisine and ingredients. He is an Australian chef who has been recognized for his career at world-class restaurants. Traveling across the world with his colleagues in the UK, he studied food ingredients and culture. So what interests you most about Korean cuisine? Just the fact that I'd never seen anything like it. It's just like a treasure trove of ingredients that you get to work with here, and it's just, just every day is fascinating. Mesmerized by the Korean culinary culture, he also invites fellow chefs from abroad and promotes the merits of Korean cuisine to the world. A lot of the chefs who have come have been surprised about how amazingly diverse Korean cuisine is and how much there is to learn. On today's Heart to Heart, we will find out about Chef Joseph Lusherwood and his attachment to Korean cuisine. Today in the studio, we have Joseph. Hello, welcome to hello. Heart to Heart, and I would like you to please say hello to our viewers that are watching, a, a short introduction. Perfect. Hello, my name is Joseph Lidgewood. I am a chef at Restaurant Evert. I um, recently moved to Korea to showcase Korean ingredients. So you've got it right there, yeah. Evert, Seoul. <laughs> um, I would like to, first of all, ask you about, uh, you know, how or what sets Evit apart from other restaurants? And could you also tell us about your cuisine? Restaurant Evit tries to take Korean ingredients and try and showcase them in a different way. And mm -hmm. I think what sets us apart from other restaurants is that I have a very kind of foreign aspect and foreign look on different ingredients. And everything we do is to try and showcase what people may have seen before and had mm -hmm. before, but in a kind of different light. Okay. Um, the cuisine is very creative and kind of innovative and just very fun. So, you know, Korean food has grown in popularity and we're seeing more and more people really appreciating, you know, the taste and the ingredients, you know, the Korean yeah. ingredients and, it, and its taste. So what interests you most about Korean cuisine? Just the fact that I'd never seen anything like it as a, as a foreigner. You come to Korea and you think it's barbecue and this uh -huh. and that, but then there's, you go to the fish market and there's monge and then you mm. go down and you learn about duenjang and, it's just like a treasure trove of ingredients that you get to work with here, and it's just, just every day is fascinating. All right. So how do your guests, when they come uh, to Evit, how do they react when they see a foreigner like yourself uh, that has such a passion for what you do? Uh, you know, you know so much about Korean food, so much about Korean ingredients, and uh, you do a wonderful job in pulling it off. So how do people react? Generally surprised, because normally... It's very hard to, to, for a foreigner to kind of get the kind of what Korean food is mm. and to, even though we're still learning and I say we're just at the early steps as well, I think they're very surprised. Uh, recently we had a, a mountain vegetable called Nungge Sungma on. With, it's grown with Myeongi side by side. Um, up, ah. So it's like a, like a mountain, mountain vegetable, but mm -hmm. looks very, very similar to dura, but a completely different flavor. And we used that recently on the menu and I think wow. that was the time I understood that. Like when I showed the case that no one, not many Korean new people mm -hmm. knew about it and they were very surprised that I knew about it. So uh -huh. yeah, they, I think very appreciative is one in one word to describe. All right. I mean, this may be a pretty obvious question, but when do you find the time to actually study these ingredients, find out or discover these ingredients and actually remember the names of these ingredients? Because I've never heard of... Uh, oh. <laughs> I think if I, if I sat down with a book and studied, uh -huh. I would be as I always do when I try and study, mm -hmm. um, I'll be asleep in about five minutes. But I think when you go to a place and you learn about it and you hear the stories mm -hmm. and why they use that ingredient, you connect with that ingredient, and then it, you can, it's impossible to forget. I heard that you go to all places possible, of course, since you're here in Korea, you, you go to all places possible all across Korea mm. uh, to find, you know, all different kinds of ingredients. Not many chefs do that. Not many are as invested. But what motivates you to do that? Yeah, yeah. we try and get out as much as much as possible. And mm -hmm. I think to really understand a cuisine, as I'm so new to the country, I want to see as much as possible. So every weekend we get out and the motivation is, it's just, I've worked with so many different ingredients with my career. And a lot of what I used to do was 
butter and salt and mm. lots of foie gras and truffles. And for me, after a while, that got really boring. So I wanted to move to a lighter style cuisine. And what motivates me is when you drive to the coast and you meet someone who's making that ingredient or using that, and then you get to connect with the, the producer. And it just makes you be able to appreciate that ingredient a whole lot more. And you can work with it so much more. Is there a place that you go to often, or do you just go to one area and then just never go back? Do you always you know, we, try to discover new locations yeah. and new ingredients? That's definitely the, the path, but I think as seasons go by, you some ingredients is not, is not ready right there and then. So we, if we're driving, say, on Sunday, we'll mm -hmm. probably stop two or three different places that we've been to before yeah. and check up and maybe get some more supplies or, or just stop in and say hello. So. All right, I'm getting very curious about your very creative dishes, and I'm sure our viewers are as well. So let's take a quick break and take a look at some photos of Joseph's creative dishes. So this is one that's been on for since we've opened, and it is uh, oolongi, uh, which is Korean black snail, with um, paired with perilla. Um, and we pair that simply with black sesame puree, um, just to showcase humble ingredients um, in a different light. Dokdo seo. The shrimp um, that is made just uh, raw, mixed with kumquat, uh -huh. um, and then a broth made of the shrimp. So super, super chilled, um, mm. but yeah, super refreshing on a cold, on a really, really hot day. And this looks like it's a fish? Yeah, that's fish bass fish? or mm -hmm. nonga. We take kohlrabi and we roast it with meiju. We make our own soybean blocks at work. Uh -huh. And then we roast it into a powder. We cook that in with the kohlrabi, which uh -huh. is the bottom. And then the roasted bass on top with a broth made from smoked eel. Mm -hmm. How do you create these dishes? I mean... Lots of work, so a lot of, like, it's a lot of 6, 7 a.m. starts ah. before. <laughs> um, and then a lot, a lot of, lot of effort goes into even a very simply, mm -hmm. simple looking dish. And do you get your inspiration for each of these dishes from, you know, different places? I mean, what yeah, is your inspiration? Definitely traveling, traveling yeah. helps. And then meeting people and mm -hmm. talking to people and hearing their experiences of working with that ingredient really inspire the menu. Okay, now these dishes all look wonderful. And I'm sure they are very delicious. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I know that you have brought one of the dishes one that we dishes, have just yeah. taken a look at in the photos. Yeah. So I would like to, if we could have it right here set on our table, yeah. and then maybe I could try a bit. Yeah, I, okay, I, wonderful. no problem, no problem. So here we have, right in front of us, oh, it looks beautiful. Very tasty as well. <laughs> here we have, this we see is tasiriki, yeah. yes, tasiriki. And then these little things that look like pebbles. They are, uh, is a black sesame puree. And then this over here, the is, three green Yeah, three dumplings. little mandu. dumplings or mandu that is filled with oolongi, which is a Korean black snail. Uh -huh. So there's a really cool history about that because it's seen as a very, like very humble ingredient because it was introduced to the rice fields into mm. Korea as a natural pesticide because mm -hmm. it kind of eats everything and then oh. lives pretty harmoniously in the rice field. So it's eaten kind of very commonly in the countryside. So I wanted to use that because it is so abundant but yet mm -hmm. so unrecognized. Okay. okay, so how do I do this? Just uh, um, it's, it's not, in a sauce? Yeah, it's so in a sauce, uh -huh. um, definitely not conventional. Um, I would grab it and then it's going to okay. be, yes. There you go. It's actually a combination of all different tastes and they blend so well together. The texture, I love the texture yeah. as well. That texture that it's kind of seen as a, a fault in the West. If you have that kind of the dakbuki texture where mm -hmm. you're kind of biting through in wherever I've cooked, it's been like that's been a fault. And that's I a, love yeah. that. But in Korea it's so celebrated, so mm. I really wanted to emphasize that in the dish as well. Mm. Oh that was really good. Mm. Yeah. Mm, thank you. No problem. <laughs> I don't want people who come here to have just an ordinary meal they could have anywhere down the road. I want people to have food that they've maybe tasted before, but something that challenges their perception of it. Something that makes them think that 
ingredients they've grown up with their whole life and then suddenly it's turned on its head. I'd like to ask you a very simple yet difficult question. What is your favorite dish? It's always uh, <laughs> one of those questions that uh, gets thrown around a lot, but I will mm. ask, uh, answer it. Um, one of the dishes that I would say is my favorite at the moment uh -huh. uh, is a rice custard dish we have at work. So mm -hmm. we have this uh, heirloom rice from a farm in the the north of the south of okay. Korea, um, and it's just a simple toasted rice custard with um, king crab. But oh. yeah, it, it's super, super simple and has that kind of sundubu texture, that kind of mm -hmm. soft tofu texture, but it really has a, a good meaning because during Korean wartime, Korea lost a lot of its rice history. Korea yeah. used to grow amazing amounts of rice, but due to the, the need to grow really quick rice, mm -hmm. they turned to most of the rice we eat now is very not, not very good for you and not very tasty. So mm. there's a lovely farm up north that's growing amazing heritage rices oh, that have amazing flavor and depth. So we're using them and it's just one of those things where you just pair two ingredients really simply, but mm -hmm. super, super nourishing. You know, are there any dishes that you could introduce to our viewers right now? Any, any dishes that are very tasty yet easy to make? Something that you could do today, tonight um, would be our songe. First of the season songe, which is amazing. Mm -hmm. um, Super, super creamy, just cut the top off. We do one with burnt cucumber, and I think the, the flavor of cucumber and songe is amazing. So that, that one's quite simple, and you could whip that up in 15 minutes and have it as a, a first snack and impress anyone, I think. Okay, but you're gonna have to go to the fish market. You're gonna have to go to the fish market. You have to, you have to go to the fish market. <laughs> you have to get the best. Songe is not easy to yeah. find. <laughs> um, what about some dishes that you know we could kind of you know cook up using seasonal ingredients? Fruits are just starting through and they're absolutely mm -hmm. amazing. So mulberry's beautiful right now. So uh -huh. if I was at home, I would probably do a really quick, simple dessert with mulberry. Mm -hmm. Just something you could, even if you did like a, an Eaton Mess style of mulberry would be absolutely beautiful. So you can make a quick meringue, quick cream, fresh fruit. They pretty much just pop them on. They do all the work for you. It's something you I would do. You make it sound very yeah, that's easy. Yeah, how I get them here. <laughs> Not easy, but you make it sound very easy. <laughs> um, now, I see that you also have an interest in the uh, traditional liquor and wine. Yeah. So what kind of traditional beverages um, would pair well with these dishes? Uh, the ones you've just mentioned or the ones that we have seen uh, the photos of? Yeah, as it's warm and my personal preferences with um, Korean traditional alcohol is mm -hmm. more the lighter style, so um, the Chongju's, the Yakju's, I've had on for ages, and that one really goes with another lighter style um, alcohol called Nokpaju, which is a beautiful, beautiful, the mineralarity works really, really well with that. But um, with a beautiful mulberry dessert, finish the evening, simple dessert, job done. I think most people, when they think about Korean food, uh, you know, most often you'll kind of um, Think about soju, yeah, right? Definitely. Uh, yeah, I think we should kind of provide more opportunities for people, yeah. you know, to, to try to pair green food with these wonderful traditional wines, yeah, and liquors like, and, yeah. and alcohol. Uh, what sparked your interest in traditional alcohol to begin with? When I when I first came, I tried to eat as much as possible, oh. and as you said, you have the sojus and you have the yes. makalis that are very very much there and ready. And then after a while, I was very curious about someone would introduce one and then you kind of learn a lot more and then it, it's crazy to think that it's not so much more known that I really wanted to promote that and show that it's an amazing, amazing rich heritage to it and goes really, really well with Korean ingredients. Mm -hmm. Joseph, you invite chefs from abroad to share in your experience of, you know, Korean cuisine and culinary culture. So could you tell us about that program? Yeah, so we currently run a program to invite young chefs to come over and learn and work with us um, in the restaurant. Mm -hmm. um, first, they travel Korea, um, getting, getting to learn the same experiences that we do and taking those experiences and then translating it into a menu. We've had two so far. Oh. So um, the most recent one, we traveled to just south of um, Seoul to a lovely 
Korean master Jang specialist mm -hmm. um, and learned so much about the Jang production and everything like that that really, really inspired. Okay. Yeah. What was the general response to the program? How did they, what did they feel about it, the chefs? Uh, a lot of the chefs who have come have been surprised about how amazingly diverse Korean cuisine is and how much there is to learn. And at the start, they think it's going to be so hard to do a menu based on mm -hmm. that. And then by the end of it, it's too many dishes and you have to kind of slim it all the way down. So. <laughs> Sounds like they have lots of fun. Mm. Um, for those of you wondering what the experience was like, we are going to take a look at um, some video. We have footage of the most recent program that yeah. you had. I believe it was uh, visiting Master Sobunne. Sobunne, yeah. Okay, so let's take a look. Master Sobunne makes traditional Korean dishes such as cheonggukjang that are made with fermented ingredients. Chef Joseph Lidgerwood studied Korean cuisine with fellow chefs at Seoilongwon, a farm that produces fermented food run by Master Sobunne. There, the chefs had an unforgettable experience. He invites chefs from abroad and continuously explores Korean cuisine ingredients. Why did Australian chef Joseph Lidgerwood become so attracted to Korean cuisine? The behind-the-scenes story of his life, inseparable from cooking, comes up next. get started in cooking was it kind of like a childhood dream maybe uh, you know? I, when I was young uh, I knew straight away I was never going to be able to have a desk job I'd probably go <laughs> crazy um, so I, I needed to find something and I used to cook um, at the local football in the cafeteria oh. just like super super simple uh -huh. like big lasagnas very and it, that even starting from that you kind of get a sense of like the fast pace and the kind of the energy and I always liked the the feeling of completion when you when you spend a day, but then you see the work and that work is represented in a dish and then mm -hmm. you get immediate feedback on that. So that's the main reason why I, I, did, I chose cooking. I know that you um, have built your career working at you know, numerous renowned restaurants um, across the world uh, at the French Laundry a three-star yep. Michelin restaurant, yep. also British Lidbury is a yep. British restaurant. Yep. Uh, just to mention a few, yep. so I'd like to ask uh, about the places that you've worked at and also if you could tell us about the experiences, um, you know, at these world-renowned restaurants. Yeah, so yeah, I've been very, very fortunate to work, as you said, at, at a number of great restaurants and growing up in Tasmania there wasn't a massive amount of great restaurants at the time or mm -hmm. ones that I wanted to work at. So very early on, I went to the UK um, and that's where I really began to take cooking seriously. So I started off in a very simple restaurant and then I moved to, and I just keep going up and I started Kitchen WA, which is one Michelin. And I, my drive and passion just, I wanted to go, then I took it to two Michelin and then mm. finally um, at the French Laundry, three Michelin style. Amazing, so, yeah. um, and then to describe an experience like that, it's, it's kind of like, I would say it's closer to like, if you're an athlete where you're searching, you want to play at the, the most elite level, you want to be playing for the best club, the right. best thing, and learning as much and developing your skills as much as possible. So mm -hmm. stressful and very, yeah. very much rewarding. Must be at that very level. extremely stressful, <laughs> I imagine. Yeah. Um, I'm sure it takes much more than just talent or interest in cooking. I mean, there's much more to it um, mm. that people like me in general would never be able to find out. But yes, yeah. I'd say definitely stressful and very difficult. Um, so when did you first come to Korea? How did you end up here in Korea? I was um, doing some pop-up restaurants. So we mm. first came here in 2016, um, and that was the first we had multiple um, pop-up restaurants planned at that stage. And uh -huh. while my time in here in Korea, we were able to travel to great locations. Like we went to Jeju, we dived with Henyo's, and we, we went to different spots. And yeah, I really fell in love with Korean cooking and Korean food and cuisine and ingredients. And that was the very, very beginning. And it definitely prompted my move back. Okay, so tell us more about these, you know, pop-up events that you've had. Because I know that you've had several since you've been in Korea as well, is yeah. that? Yes. yes, so tell us about them. During my time with the pop-ups, we did multiple locations, mm -hmm. uh, 15 in total. Oh. Um, and then really, really, so oh, a little bit of a backstory. So 
I worked at very traditional restaurants where you work at downstairs in a kitchen and mm. you just work and you don't really see the sunlight. Um, and then I wanted to see what was out there and learn more about yeah. cuisine. So we started a restaurant group that traveled and did multiple pop-ups mm. around the world in crazy locations and just wanted to make it as fun and by that stage, we were sick of stuffy restaurants and stuffy fine dining restaurants where you don't know which fork you're grabbing from. So we wanted it to be uh, as crazy as possible. So we did ones on trains in Vietnam, like an overnight train. Wow. Um, we did a bagel shop in Taiwan. We took um, 12 guests to Base Camp Everest on a like a 10-day journey, which nearly killed me. My uh, altitude sickness nearly uh, got me, but we struggled through it. But yeah, just trying to see that what a restaurant could be. A restaurant isn't four walls, it's mm. an experience. And that's what I really learned along the way. Wow, sounds like an amazing experience. Yeah. Not yeah. just once, but uh, you know, on several occasions. <laughs> yes, many, many times. Yeah. Well, where did you get the idea, you know, to, how did you decide where to go and what you will be doing for each event? A lot of it was naively done on what don't we know the most about? And a lot was, uh -huh. that's what prompted the move to Korea is like, we know, th three or four things about Korean cuisine and mm -hmm. that's a good enough reason to come to the country and mm -hmm. learn more because there's and as we found out there is so so much more and that was the main driving force was mm -hmm. learning uh, and we would just pick based on our lack of knowledge of that region or area. Mm -hmm. So you have had several pop-up restaurants in many parts of the world also yeah. across in Korea as well. Yes. Um, and you've visited many, many cities, countries and cities. So I'm sure you have, oh gosh, so many interesting stories or, you oh. know, <laughs> experience to, to share with people. But could you perhaps choose one or, or two to share with us on the show today? Myanmar was a really good one. We did, mm -hmm. a, um, we did several pop-ups. Um, and beforehand, we traveled to Shan State and we learned all about Myanmar or Burmese border food. Uh -huh. uh, and we had a lovely location planned. Um, in this like old um, colonial building and everyone sat down and it was, Myanmar was extremely hot at the best of times and it was 40 degrees and all the air conditioning was um, all, all going, everything was going smoothly. Uh -huh. And then at about just halfway through, all the lights drop out because uh -huh. Myanmar has rolling blackouts. Um, mm. So for five minutes we were in complete darkness and then all the guests didn't know what to do. And luckily enough, we had some pretty proactive team members. So we had, candles out, we had little fans out, uh -huh. we had all this stuff and we were, we were cooking on coal. We cooked the whole menu oh, for wow. like 10, 15 minutes on coal and during the guests and when the lights came up, there was a, an eruption of applause and mm -hmm. that really stands out for me as a, a really wow. great moment. So I'm sure you thank that blackout. <laughs> <laughs> You're lucky there was, was that blackout. Like, <laughs> but now yeah. looking back, it's uh, looking a, back. a really great moment. Now, if you had a single opportunity to open up, you know, a pop-up restaurant, you know, if you had this one single opportunity to do, you know, a pop-up event, where would you do it? For the longest time, we've been pushing the boundaries um, with pop-up restaurants and seeing where we can go. And I mm -hmm. think if I had to do one, I had my ultimate choice, I'd probably do it in space. Mm -hmm. I would probably do as far as, like, on the space shuttle or out, out of orbit, because I just think that that would be an amazing, amazing experience and another set of challenges of how do you design food that would be able to be taken up and everything mm -hmm. like that, and that would offer another set of challenges. Sounds very exciting. <music> Lastly, we're down to our final question. Uh, tell us about your vision for Restaurant Avid. Oh, well. At the moment, we're in our early ages and early stages of learning and looking forward. So at the moment, the vision is to get the word out as much as possible about Korean cuisine, mm -hmm. Korean ingredients, and wherever that takes us on the line. We have no real finishing point. This is a journey that we're beginning and going to continue forward, creating, exploring, and learning as much as we can. Mm -hmm. I'd like to thank you so much for joining us on the thank show. You thank you for giving me the opportunity to try that delicious dish. Yep. And I was really amazed. I was surprised at um, you know how much you knew and how much passion you have for Korean cuisine and the ingredients and traditional you know alcohol. Um, it was a time for me to think back and you know think to myself how much I know about Korean cuisine. <laughs> well, thank you once again. No, thank you very much. Thank you.